Dr. Mark Lewis, President and CEO of the newly established Purdue Applied Research Center, Perry, will discuss his vision for the organization and the unique opportunities it brings for collaboration with NSWC Crane, as well as the businesses here at Westgate. He will also discuss how Perry and Crane can combine their efforts to advance this vital component of American defense. I'm guessing that Dr. Lewis would mention this, but I just have to say that at the last minute a couple weeks ago, he was invited to be at a meeting at the White House on this exact same date. Well, as you can guess, he called me and texted or emailed me and said, unfortunately, I can't make it. And I said, absolutely not. You tell them no, that this is very important. So guess what happened? I really didn't say that. But anyway, he, he did make concessions and he is here today. So, so we're very proud to have him here. Uh, very interested to see what he's going to do and hear what we're going to hear about today. So without further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Mark Lewis. And by the way, that, that story is true. And I, uh, and I had this realization at one point. How often do you get to say no to the Director of National Intelligence? Like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't come to your meeting because I had this realization. I don't work for her. So, <laughs> but I kind of work for you guys. So, so you know, priorities, priorities. Well, hey, th thanks for the opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, and thanks for sticking around. Uh, for those of you who were here, here all afternoon and stuck around a little bit longer, I appreciate it. Um, I get to tell you about an exciting new venture, relatively new venture, uh, as was mentioned, the Purdue Applied Research Institute. Um, I'm, I'm still a newcomer at Purdue, so I'm coming up on five months. I'm still finding newcomer newcomer status. So far, they're letting me get away with it. Um, but it was it was obviously an exciting venture that that uh, Purdue uh, you, lured me lured me in to, to do this job. And um, as one of the one of the things I hope you'll see is one of the critical elements of the work that we're doing at Purdue Applied Research Institute relates to all the interactions we have with NSWC Crane and then the greater crane ecosystem. Um, that was one of the things that brought me to Purdue, and it, for, for my money, that's one of the things that will make us successful. Having this government partner that is so committed to the success of the entire Indian ecosystem. So for all of you from Crane who are in the audience, thank you. Um, we start off and see if this works. Yes. Oh, it did? All right. So, there we go. All right. What, what is Parry? Well, Purdue, Purdue created Parry with the basic mission of applying intellectual resources on campus, the faculty members, the work done by students, by graduate students, but finding opportunities to take what's being done in the laboratory and apply it to some critical problems of significance to the nation and in some cases the world, primarily with a focus on national security but also in other areas, including global development, food security, education, et cetera. Um, a good analogy for Parry is there are other universities that have organizations like this. Georgia Tech has had the Georgia Tech Research Institute for many years. The Johns Hopkins, uh, uh, Johns Hopkins has the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. MIT has Lincoln Laboratories. So the idea was to create an organization that could go from the laboratory to the end user, bridge that gap, when I was in the Pentagon, we referred to it as the Valley of Death. Bridge the Valley of Death between what goes on on campus and what we can deliver to, to uh, uh, government, government sponsors and, and other, other customers. Um, in order to do that, Parry from the very beginning was envisioned as an organization that can handle clearances, that can do secure work, that can do sensitive topics, where staff would be you know, reviewed. We worry about whether they're clearable, for example where projects could be done at a CUI secret, top secret level, and where facilities could also be clear. Um, I will tell you that, again, one of the things that really attracted me to Purdue is the embrace that you see across the Purdue campus of national security as a priority. Um, priority in education, priority in workforce, and also priority in research. And Parry, I think, is an expression of that. Um, I'll tell you the quick anecdote that um, when I, when I signed up with Purdue, I was taking this job, I was talking to a colleague of mine in the Pentagon, uh, Dave Lenny, who is currently the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. So all the folks you heard on the podium today, they all work for Dave Lenny. And uh, he's, got, he's got the office I had until, until uh, the change in administration. So I was telling him what I was doing and what the goal was and Purdue's aspirations. And he just looked at me and said, well, it's about time. Because of you know, the great work that Purdue does, Get that work, take that, that, that work to the level where it can be, be um, applied to these critical problems. 
Um, few, few logistics issues. So Parry it was created as a 501c3 entity. That means it's a not-for-profit corporation which is wholly owned by Purdue University. It is technically a university-affiliated research institute um, for government contracts, because that means it's eligible for what's called SECA 3 sole source contracting. The same mechanism by which you are sent to party C's to be contracted. So if you're a government contractor and you want to work for Purdue, hey, you can work with us, we're, we're sole source. Um, the same. Um, it was actually funded with a very significant investment from the campus. Uh, we had a, a total dollar value between facilities, infrastructure, even personnel, works out to in excess of about $120 million. And you can almost go keep another $70 million for other facilities that are going to support, uh, support parity. So in a real sense, it's about $200 million investment that a bet that the campus has placed. And for that reason, I like to describe parity as kind of a new startup, but with the back up, backing up, backing of a major, major university. I mentioned it's designed to do classified work. Uh, leveraging capabilities on campus, so it's not standalone. If it were standalone, well, frankly, Purdue would have set up its organization. That means including faculty members, having seconded faculty members who spend some of their time on campus, some of their time with us, but also having some dedicated staff. Um, one of the things that makes Perry special also is uh, we're small, we're light, we're flexible, we have easier hiring authorities than the rest of the campus, we have easier contracting than the rest of the campus. Um, so we're kind of we're, we're kind of that that the, the, the outlaw part of Purdue when it comes well that's bad choice of words. We're the, the new the new innovative light part of, of Purdue when it comes to the project management. Let's see. Um, I want to put it in the context of the rest of Purdue. So Purdue is by any reckoning a research powerhouse. I think all of you know. And this slide actually uh, comes comes uh, from the office of the executive vice president, president for research. Uh, Karen Plough, whose office oversees Parry. So they do the support work for Parry, even though we're a separate LLC, we get lots and lots of support from the campus. And this is just a snapshot of the full range of projects. And of course, if I went through the whole list of activities that are underway at Purdue, we would be here all through the night into tomorrow. It's a total research portfolio of about $600 million covering everything from engineering to the humanities. But the bottom line is there is an incredible resource there on campus, which we can roll into the work we're doing in national security. And here's how Parity fits in. So there's this ecosystem of innovation, if you will, at Purdue. Um, and one of the things that Purdue does really well, in my opinion, is mostly an outsider's opinion, is linking up doing these interdisciplinary solutions to problems, linking different colleges, linking institutes, centers. Um, Purdue has invested in this Discovery Park District that's being spearheaded by Dan DeLaurentis, bringing in industry to work with, with uh, the campus. And there we are in the midst of all that ecosystem. And there's a great quote that I grabbed from Karen, is Purdue research is flexibly structured to enable interdisciplinary breakthroughs across Purdue and to meet the needs of our governmental, corporate, and academic partners. And I will tell you as an aside, when, when I was a graduate student, my PhD advisor once pulled me, pulled me aside and said, hey, I want to make the following observation. If you look at most of the great innovations in science and engineering, they came from people who started in one field and then jumped to another and took the skills from that first field and applied it to the other. The moral story is interdisciplinarity is where so many of our breakthroughs come from. And that's a philosophy, a philosophy that clearly has been embraced by Purdue and one of the things that's going to be driving this effect. All right, so let's go to organization of character. Um, we've got many pieces to character. Uh, of course, hypersonics. Uh, why Purdue has had a long history in hypersonics. We've got great facilities in hypersonics. They're the new CEO who got hired at Parry is a hypersonics guy, as I think a lot of you know. So, of course, hypersonics is a very key element of what, what we are doing and what we plan to do. Um, I'll talk a little bit more detail about some of our hypersonic facilities, uh, but you'll see that we're making significant investments in test facilities, infrastructure, wind tunnels, manufacturing capabilities, and, of course, leveraging that off of, off of indigenous uh, research personnel. Another major area for uh, Parry is microelectronics. That will not be a surprise to anyone here. Purdue has an incredible capability microelectronics. NSWC Crane has a, 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 an intense focus on microelectronics, as they do with hypersonic. It's a natural area for us. Um, I can, if I will, 
tell you a, a quick little anecdote. So when I was in the Pentagon, um, in, in uh, my stint in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense and Research and Engineering, we didn't have 14 parties, we had 11 parties. But they kind of looked like 14 parties. So the good news is they didn't actually change. And if you had asked me what our top priorities were, uh, number one and number two were microelectronics and microsoft. And our partners for that in the Pentagon, in both those areas, were, was an SWC crane. Um, we, uh, we began uh, uh, the uh, Joint Hypersonic Transition Office, <coughs> created a, a hypersonic field office at Crane that Sarah Armstrong is leading right now. In microelectronics, we looked at Crane to lead the TNAM program, and not surprisingly, when microelectronic commons effort came, Crane was going to play a key role. So, it's an, these are two areas of strong interest for Purdue. Obviously, also a very strong interest for, for our, our uh, friends at NSA. Um, the Infrastructure and Innovation Lab is another key area, and I'll show you some more details in a moment. Another key area that we have as part of our, um, that's a laboratory that's led by one of our faculty members in the, the Department of Civil Engineering, a professor by the name of Amit Varma. And they basically work on testing of structures, but also the construction of, of structures at low cost with high capability. That has a lot of national security implications. You want to build a new missile tube, and you, you want to put it deep in the ground, or you want to, want to spend a lot of money doing it. Um, our infrastructure and innovation lab can help you figure out how to do that. Energetics, another key area. Long, long history of work in energetics. Um, so when I was a graduate student, I was looking at faculty positions. I narrowed it down to two universities. One was Purdue. The other was where I wound up working at the University of Maryland for about 35 years. And, well, I can tell you about that decision process. You know, it's nice to create a 30, nice to finally uh, correct a 35 year old mistake. But, um, even at that time, 35 years ago, Purdue was one of the few universities that did energetic materials, uh, specifically for solid rocket fuels, but also for explosive materials. And that tradition has continued. So we're looking to expand tremendously in the energetics area. Uh, Professor Steve Bowden at on campus, I'm sure many of you know, is leading that effort. And uh, the campus is looking to make significant investments in. And then finally, we have a whole part of Purdue, uh, of uh, Cary, that is tech acceleration and innovation. And sometimes I call that Cary miscellaneous. Don't quote me on that. But you, you might know someone who works at that part of Cary. But that's kind of the part of Cary that does all the other stuff. Um, technology innovation, they invest in new companies. Uh, we've got a program called Dial Ventures that invests uh, innovative agriculture companies. Um, we've got a part of that, that that does global development. They're in countries around the world doing education, doing food security. And just as a, an act of, when I first signed up with Harry, the, the Purdue leadership said, you know, we put Harry together, we had all the national security stuff, and then we had some of the agriculture stuff. And you're the new CEO, so. You don't think that other stuff fits in, we can find some other place for you to house it. And that was actually my going-in model. And then after examining it, I said, no, this stuff is really quite amazing. Not only is it amazing, but it also relates to national security because it's soft power, right? It's the application of, of other resources, economic power, agriculture power, to the support of national security goals. So that is very much, we were very much retaining that as a robust portion of our portfolio. <laughs> All right, so let me say a word about the CEO leadership. So um, step one, when I when I stepped into the role, was to start filling out my the leadership portfolio. Uh, so I'm the president and CEO. Um, you know, a couple couple of biographical notes. As I mentioned I spent a couple of years in the Pentagon in OUSD R&D, Air Force Chief Scientist before that. So let's see, how many Navy folks in the room? Yeah, okay, I'm gonna apologize. I bleed Air Force blue. I, I, my last job was purple, but I'm biased in the Air Force. I'm not gonna call it that time. But I love the Navy too. Um, but I actually, I spent most of my career in academia as a, as a university professor. Um, so so coming back to academia was was, was a, a great deal of fun. Um, my chief operating officer, and I know many of you have interacted with him, is uh, Dr. Kevin Massey. Uh, Kevin was a DARPA PM. Uh, he worked at the Georgia Tech Research Institute. He's had experience with small organizations. Um, he's got a background in industry at Ford, Pratt Whitney, Raytheon, and most recently, Lighthouse. Uh, he worked for Steve Cook in Dynetics, which is part of Lighthouse. 
please forgive me for stealing it, by the way. So just in case that comes up. Awkward conversation. Um, but but uh, Kevin also comes with an academic career, uh, including uh, time in Australia running an ac academic department. He's a member of the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board. Um, our Chief External Relations Officer, who I also know many of you have interacted with, is Ms. K.M. Mentori, who I describe as the single most connected human being that I know, in the Washington, D.C. ecosystem. If there is a member of Congress, she knows that member. If there is a staffer who works with that member of Congress, she will know the staffer. Um, so Kay has stepped in and she's going to be representing, she's working on the Hill, she's working with companies, small companies, large companies. Uh, she's got a background as a legislative affairs officer for the Green Corps. She's an attorney by training. Uh, she spent many years uh, working for the ABC News affiliate in uh, the greater Los Angeles area. Um, so she knows all aspects, all aspects of, of, of Mr. Um, our chief legal officer is Mr. Jerry Tchaikovsky. Uh, he was hired before me, by the way. And um, one of my uh, retired Air Force friends from the Air Force Acquisition Office actually described Jerry as the single best lawyer she has ever worked with. And I was kind of skeptical about that. And I started working with Jerry. And yes, she was right. He is the single best lawyer that I have ever worked with. Um, and I know you're all thinking that might be a low bar. It's not a low bar. Some of my best friends are lawyers, but Jerry is, is outstanding. And he's helping to stand up for certain things. And then finally, uh, Ms. Kayla Shanley, who uh, I unabashedly stole from my previous position uh, at the National Defense Industrial Association, where she was my chief of staff there. Um, I stole, and she's my chief of staff. And uh, I, I also stole the executive assistant for the CEO at the National Defense Industrial Association. But I think he's pretty good. Um, all right, so with that, let me also tell you some exciting news. You guys are the first to hear this. So we're setting up a board of advisors for parents. It's going to be chaired by the Honorable Lisa Hirschman. So uh, I know Lisa is a household name in the great state of Indiana. Uh, she was the chief management officer in the Pentagon in the previous administration. So I made her the number three person in the Pentagon. And um, she's leading up this board that's going to give us technical and business advice. Um, we're still populating the board. We already have uh, General Paul Carlisle as one of our board members. Uh, one of the most beloved four-star uh, generals in, in Air Force history. Paul Madera, who is uh, the Managing Director of American Capital out in California. And then Michael McCluskey just agreed to serve, he's the co-founder and the CEO of Select Milk Products, with expertise in agriculture. So we're not forgetting the global development part of, of, of Power. That's an important part of what we do. And you're going to be hearing some more of those uh, advisors uh, in, coming, in coming weeks. All right, so let's get into some of the details. I'll show you some of the facilities of the building, some of the activities that we have underway. And then I'll open up for questions. So I mentioned hypersonics, obviously, a big area of interest and investment for us. Um, our cornerstone of our work in hypersonics is the building that you see pictured here, which is called the HARC. Oh, by the way, those of you in the DOD, Purdue loves acronyms every bit as much as the DOD loves them. And it was like, welcome home. They, 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 they speak in acronym speak. I love it. So everything at Purdue has an acronym, so this is the HARC. Um, and the HARC is a building which has three major components to it. It has a hypersonic wind tunnel that was originally built by NASA in the 1960s. Wound up uh, in the 1990s, was sent up to a company on Long Island, ultimately wound up in the hands of Northrop Grumman. Northrop Grumman wasn't using it, mostly because they found out that the Raytheons and the Lockheed's in the world didn't want to pay Northrop to do testing for them. So Northrop wasn't using it, so donated it to the university for the cost of transportation. Actually, that's a little bit of a lie. They sold it to the university for $10 which cracks me up, because when I was first told the story, I said, $10, why 10? I mean, kind of $1. And I finally asked a Northrop person, why did you sell it for $10, not $1? And she said, I don't know, I'll get back to you. And two weeks later, she called me back and said, oh, I found out why. Because when Northrop picked up the tunnel, we bought it from another company for $10. So they wanted to break even on the deal. So that one cracked me up. I said, you know, for me, I would have sold it to us for $11. You could have claimed you made a profit, but whatever. So we're right now in the process of rebuilding that wind tunnel. Um, I can't show you a picture of that tunnel because it is uh, ITAR restricted. But it's nice to say it is a Mach 5 to Mach 25 facility. It's a beautiful facility and it's getting all new instrumentation. All, uh, all, it, it's uh, getting sensors and uh, fluid visualization capabilities. It's going to bring it up to a world class standard. Next door to that, we're building another wind tunnel, which is a Mach 8 quiet supersonic tunnel. It's a very special type of hypersonic wind tunnel. 
That was tenured in many ways at Purdue. So Purdue faculty member Steve Schneider developed something called the Mach 6 quiet supersonic bomb. And now we're building a Mach 8 version of that bomb. Now you might say, okay, gee, 6 to 8, what's the big deal? Um, here's the big deal. When you're building a facility like a, a wind tunnel, or actually when you're building an airplane, the energy associated goes with the velocity squared. So the power goes with velocity cubed. So you double the speed, you double the Mach number, you increase the complexity of the energy ball by a factor of a p. All which is to say, Mach 8 is a heck of a lot more challenging than Mach 6. So this is truly going to be a state-of-the-art capability. Um, these are very difficult wind tunnels to build. You have to pay incredibly close attention. It's in order to be a quiet tunnel, you have to eliminate all the disturbances that you normally have in a wind tunnel that change the flow properties. So you basically make this, you, you make this thing as rock solid as possible, and the inside surfaces inside the wind tunnel have to be basically glass smooth. So quite a technical challenge. And then in the front of this building, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail, is a whole manufacturing facility called the Ham TC, which has additive manufacturing equipment, high temperature metals, ultimately high temperature ceramics, state of the art material manufacturing capabilities for a whole range of hypersonic applications. And, and I can tell you, I've already had some uh, industry colleagues walk through that manufacturing facility, and they've practically been salivating when they've seen the equipment that we're putting in there. I had one, one individual from one of the primes tell me, oh my god, I would kill for you. Actually, have to kill you. Fun is to do some work in here, but all right. So, a um, little bit more detail about that facility, that manufacturing center. Um, basically, the, the key element of this is that that center can do everything, including building, joining, and testing the material. So they can make the part, they can assemble the parts, and then they can put it through a full range of testing. And that makes it quite unique. We're partnered with GE Additive to do this. They've been working with us in supplying machines, and this, in some cases, developing whole new classes of machines to populate um, this this uh, laboratory. All right, um, let me jump a little bit to the Kyrie Tech Acceleration and Innovation Lab, which includes the global development and innovation part of the portfolio. And this is part of that soft power uh, algorithm for Kyrie, uh, using innovation research. This part of PARI works across the globe. The focus on issues related to humanitarian assistance, and education, food security, um, they're focused on uh, energy issues, environment, and also data science. So, really unique portfolio. It's run by a, a gentleman named John Glover. He's based in DC. He works at the State Department, he works with USAID, but also interacts with the National Security Films. Um, this leverages a whole part of the Purdue campus that, frankly, I normally wouldn't access. I'm, I'm an engineer by training. Normally, I'd be knocking indoors in engineering. But this reaches to other parts of the campus, so that makes it especially exciting. Um, they do very innovative work, also, on uh, building resilience in support of this infrastructure, including, including cybersecurity for food, cybersecurity for energy. So, lots on their plate. Um, another part of the Tech Acceleration Innovation Lab I mentioned earlier is critical dial. So dial stands for the oh, that dial stands for the Digital Innovation and Agri Food Systems Laboratory. Again, Purdue loves acronyms. Um, and they tackle problems that primarily focus on the United States, but also the rest of the world, uh, on some of the same issues I mentioned before: food safety, supply chain security, sustainability. But they do it essentially as a venture capital. They invest in companies, small companies, they do venture calls, they do an investment, and then will actually own a small piece of that company if it's successful. So um, when I first signed up for this job, I was actually quite surprised to find out, wow, I actually own a venture capital fund as part of, of Harry. Um, and, and, and right now, though, it's focused primarily on agriculture. Uh, we have a vision for this uh, expanding um, here's a capability that I want to show off. I mentioned that we do work in uh, uh, civil engineering. Uh, this is part of the Parry Infrastructure Innovation Lab. Um, we're trying to figure out how to pronounce it. 
the acronym that would come out of that. Because you can call it pill, that doesn't sound good. You can call it pile. That was kind of rude, although pile, you know, pile driving. But anyway, the infrastructure innovation lab, that includes the infrastructure research and innovation solutions part of Carol. And this is a portion of the organization that I mentioned that's owned by, that's run by uh, Professor Hami Parma. And this is, I believe, the single most impressive single engineering laboratory that I have ever seen on a university campus. Um, this is a facility, it's a huge facility that has manufacturing capabilities, has testing capabilities. Uh, it was featured a couple of weeks ago on CBS Sunday morning. There was an art, there was a story about an architect who built a building using new methods of concrete manufacturing. And those methods were developed in this laboratory. A good way to think about it is that Professor Barma and his uh, co-workers have developed solutions for making stressed concrete, concrete structures without having to put all the rebars inside. Uh, you can think of it that they build concrete structures that look like ice cream sandwiches. You got steel on the outside, concrete on the, in, on the inside. And you can create these things in a fraction of the time that it normally takes to build reinforced concrete structures. So again, lots of beauty applications, including for uh, uh, you know, uh, missile, missile silos and uh, other facilities that you, you might be interested. All right, so that's kind of a, an overview of some of this still. I want to come back to our interests in collaboration with NSFC, right? So from, I think, the second day that I was on the job, I started getting phone calls from, from the good folks in Ukraine, some in this room, uh, looking for opportunities where they could work with us. And, and one of the first key areas is, of course, microelectronics. So we already have uh, in place, in place a contract with Crane uh, on microelectronics that's going to focus on a couple of areas, uh, including workforce, um, rad hard microelectronics. But a really important part of that is locating people here at Westgate. So our president, Mung Chang, made a firm commitment for, for, for you at Crane, and Harry, I think, is part of that. Part of that commitment. We want people here, we want to use facilities here. We want a steady flow of ideas between West Lafayette and uh, Crane, Indiana. Uh, we're planning on using clean room space uh, at uh, Foundry One here at Westgate. And again, we've got some very ambitious plans. Also working with some of the corporate partners that I think are in this room to build out that capability. Um, I, I will put some that the relationship between Harry and NSWC Crane, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is the single most relationship, most important relationship. Right. It's the cornerstone for what we're trying to do. We have another activity going on right now with NSWC Crane. That is uh, a crater for hypersonics. And Pat Schaefer at NSWC Crane is helping that group. And that's been essential for many reasons, not the least of which is, of course, our own investment in hypersonics. But uh, NSWC Crane is, is helping us do the certification for all of our facilities. So that PAR facility that I showed you, that I'll go back to. That picture. So that, that heart facility, uh, most of that building will be cleared space, cleared up with TSSCI. The wind tunnels are basically being built in skip space, so uh, which, which is quite a challenge, by the way, as you can imagine. Um, but we've been partnered with NSC Crane in order to do that, and it's quite ambitious, of course, but we think it's important to be able to deliver what the nation needs in hypersonic Um If I kind of come back to future opportunities, or where are we going in the future? Well, basically, whoops. Um, as we'll not surprise you, we're looking for lots of expansion in the areas of microelectronics and hypersonics, especially with the advent of the microelectronic commons. Um, hypersonics, the mock TV program, uh, something that we're extremely excited about. For, uh, for those of you who've seen me quoted recently in the press or done some interviews where I talked about some of the, some of the big uh, stumbling blocks in, that we face in advancing hypersonics. And, and one of them certainly is our nation's test and evaluation capability. Um, as, I like, as, as, as I like to tell, or more correctly, as it pains me to tell people, um, one of the ways that our peer competitors got ahead of us was investing in test and evaluation capability. Put another way, the Chinese were building wind tunnels at about the same rate that we were disbanding. And the same is true in our flight test capabilities. We have allowed our flight test so there are some really good folks in the Pentagon who are focused on fixing that. I think you heard, of those of you who heard in the last section, you heard mention of George Rumford, who runs the Test Resource Management Center. One of their programs is the Mock TV program. Uh, it's absolutely essential if this nation 
just to step up to the plate and exercise and have that testing ability developed. And, and we at Perry want to be a part of that, um, both in the ground test but ultimately uh, uh, filling in the fuel pipelines. Um, I mentioned energetic materials as one of our areas. Um, we see lots of investment opportunities and research opportunities for that material, building on our capabilities on campus. Given the fact that we can actually do things just off campus at what's called the Zucro Laboratory Complex, where we can kind of light stuff and burn stuff, and I don't want to say explode stuff, and in case anyone from the surrounding neighborhood is in the room, but you know, we can actually test energetic materials and leverage the big investment that was available. And finally, another area that we're, we're uh, very interested in is looking at optical materials. Um, we know it's an interest with Navy. It's certainly an interest in a lot of work underway um, on campus, and we want to start building that area and possibly creating a whole new division within Parry that will line up with the hypersonics and microphysical electronics and the energy materials. A whole new division in optical materials. So that's kind of the future as we see. So last note, I will tell you. Um, right now, our, our three centers of, of, of uh, our, our three main geographic centers, obviously West Lafayette, but Crane, Indiana, and then our third center is in Washington D.C. And we are headquartered in Washington D.C. Uh, I, I will I will tell you when when uh, Mung Chang asked me if I would do this job, I said, Well, gosh, it sounds fantastic, but there's one problem. Uh, I kind of got family in the D.C. area, and my wife doesn't want to leave the DC area and he even said, that's fantastic. Purdue wants to have a strong presence in DC. And indeed, we're building out a, a strong footprint in, in Washington, DC. We've got the Prock Institute for Tech Diplomacy in DC. We have other activities in DC and we're looking for an expanded, an expanded footprint. Um, it also means that I am racking up the frequent flyer miles between Washington, DC and Indiana. Uh, I've got to know that Indiana airport really well. I keep telling the folks at Purdue, we really need to restore commercial air service right to campus if it doesn't happen they don't anymore. Um, but uh, it's coming back. I keep hearing it. It's coming back. By the way, whenever I tell anyone, like, the service is coming back, yeah, we've been hearing that for a while. But it's really coming. What we also really need, by the way, is commercial air service from West Lafayette right at that very frame. If we can get that in place, I will be a super happy camper. So, all right, we will we will talk to them. Um, with that, that, that was the end of my formal remarks. Um, I, I was hoping I got time for questions and comments and reflections. And uh, I thank you for your attention late on a, late on a Monday. Thank you. No one have any questions? Oh, come on. Someone's going to have a question. Here you go. Yeah. The parts. Yes. Wind tunnels. Yes. I can't get my head around. Are, are they, what are the dimensions? What, what, oh. what happens? Uh, uh, how do they utilize? Okay, so the dimensions are really big. <laughs> yeah. I can get to the, I can go to the size of the test section. But um, so we've got, as I mentioned, we've got the two facilities right now the high pulse, that's the hypersonic wind tunnel that goes from Mach 5 to Mach 25. That's in, I don't know if you can read the number, it's almost 12,000 square foot. And that tunnel fills most of um, So it runs almost the length of the building. And, that, the, and that's, that's mostly in place, by the way. So that is uh, scheduled to be uh, first operational in January of 24. And crews are moving along really quickly like that. Mostly students, students help reassembling this one tunnel, making it much better than it ever was. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you my, my favorite story about that tunnel. So last time I was visiting Park, you know, put my head in and seeing how progress was going. One of the one of the grad students was really excited because when the tunnel arrived, it came with a whole box of documents and a bunch of them started going through the documents. And they found the original blueprints for this tunnel, which were drawn up by NASA, and it was, it was first envisioned in 1963. It means it's actually younger than I am, but not by much. Um, and these blueprints were beautiful. And the tunnel today actually looks very little like the original. It's been rebuilt, redesigned over the years. But it's got an incredible long history. It's an incredible capable, it's an incredibly capable facility. Um, the Mach 8 tunnel, you can see that's going to be over 14,000 square feet. And that again, very large test section. Um, the, the tunnel that type, supersonic tunnels, are especially important for studying boundary layer transition. So that's when fluid goes very smooth and laminar to chaotic. 
Um, that's a really important thing to, to study. For the reason that the behavior of any hypersonic vehicle actually depends on the state, in part, on the state of the airflow right along the surface of the vehicle. And depending on whether the flow is smooth and laminar or chaotic and turbulent, that will dictate the drag of the vehicle, how much resistance it experiences as it's flying through the atmosphere. It will also tell you how hot the vehicle is. Um, we've had a couple of experiences as a nation where our lack of understanding of where flow goes from laminar to turbulent, from smooth to chaotic, has made him broken a program. Um, DARPA had a program called the HTV2, the Hypersonic Test Vehicle 2, that they tested um, in the uh, early 2010s. They tested it twice and they lost it both times. And in retrospect, they lost it because of our lack of understanding of when flow goes to laminar and So that's something that that Mach 8 tunnel will help us resolve. Um, I started really worrying about the Chinese when I saw that they were building supersonic, quiet supersonic tunnels. So again, crit critical element of the current system. Other questions? John, you're being too quiet. I guess, you know, we want to talk about proximity matters. Yes. So with having Perry people here and having you in DC, can you just comment on how you see that being advantageous for, we're selfish for us versus other organizations in the US? Yeah, so, you know, let me tell you one of the things that I, I have come to love about Indiana. Um, I don't know of any state that does it as well as Indiana when it comes to linking industry and government and universities. And, and I, I'll, I'll tell you, I have, I have lots and lots of war stories, not only from depending on but I spent a lot of years at another university. Right? So um, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you a couple of my contrasts between how Indiana does things in other states. So at that other unnamed university that I spent a lot of time at, I won't tell you the name you probably picked up on it earlier, but I won't tell you the name, but it, it rhymes with Schmerlin. Um, <laughs> so when you go to the campus in the University of Maryland, um, just off campus is this big um, area, development area, it's called MTech. And MTech was envisioned as a government, industry, academic campus. The university envisioned it as being something like Research Triangle Park in North Carolina, right? where you have government funding agencies and less. All right. Um, they've been trying to make this thing work for as long as I've been affiliated with the University of Maryland, previously, like 35 years ago. Do you think it'll work? They can't get Edward tenants, they can't get industry to buy in, they've got the American Institute of Physics there, they've got a government funding agency, IARPA, they finally packed up and left. And I step back and I say, so you got you got a piece of land inside the Washington Beltway. It's actually inside the Beltway. There's a subway station across the street from this piece of land. There's every government funding agency you can imagine around this piece of land. And then there's a university walking distance from this piece of land. And you can't make it work. Now I show up at Purdue. And I walk across the street from Purdue and I see this discovery park that I made by Andy Lennox. Saab is there. Rolls-Royce is there. We've got small companies piling in. We've got so much interest in the state government. It's absolutely remarkable. Right? Indiana knows how to do it right. That's why I keep telling money, you need to get air service into, into West Lafayette because, oh my god, that thing would really pick up. Um, then the other thing that really struck me, this is another anecdote. This is from before I signed on with Purdue. So when I was told to um, at one point, I came to a meeting on the Purdue campus. And uh, at the end of the meeting, um, that evening, we had a dinner event at the President's House. Mitch Daniels was still in Mung was the Dean of Engineering. No, actually, Mung was uh, doing his time the state, was the State Department S&P advisor. And so I'm sitting at this dinner table with Mitch Daniels. And of course, former governor, head of OMB, president of the campus, Sitting on his right is the governor of the state, Eric Holcomb. Sitting next to Eric Holcomb is Senator Young. On the other side, Congressman Banks. On the other side of Congressman Banks, the president of Rolls-Royce North America. All right, I'm looking at this combination of people. And what I was, what struck me was not only were they just there, these 
these folks, I mean, they knew each other well. I mean, they were talking shop with this there. And man, they get it. And it was kind of this group hunting philosophy. Now, I got to tell you, a couple weeks later, I was talking to my friend who's actually the president at the University of Maryland. And I was actually telling him this story. And I said, you know, I was a faculty member at Maryland for 35 years. I never once saw the governor of the state of Maryland on that campus. Never once. Um, I've been to Purdue. I've seen the governor of Indiana on the Purdue campus, gosh, at least four times. And not just floating in and floating out, actually there and sitting through meetings, sitting in the front row of conferences, absorbing everything there is to be absorbed. Um, Indiana knows how to do it. And so getting back to your point about proximity, you're exactly right. Proximity is important. Um, having a footprint in West Lafayette, having a footprint here at Crane, but also it's important to get that footprint to be safe. And that all, all three of those pieces interact on a fairly regular basis. Right? Because the engagement in DC is also absolutely critical. Um, we're, we're looking to build office space right now, not just for Parry, but for all of Purdue. Uh, a lot of universities are doing this. Uh, you, visit, you visit DC now, you can see Arizona State's got their building. I think Indiana University has a building. Um, North, uh, Northwestern's got a building. Um, I don't necessarily think we'll have a building, but I want to have a space where you know, people will know that's the Purdue building. And then right up in the elevator, and the door is open, and that's Purdue. And I want it to be more than Purdue. I want it to be a, an extension of the state of Indiana. And we're working to do that right now. So that's one of our goals that I haven't mentioned, but we're looking to identify a good location for our DC headquarters. And you know, I'll come back to one of the people you saw in that chart, uh, Kay Maturi, one of the reasons that we brought her on board. She knows industry really well. She knows the big players. She knows the small players. But she knows the hill extremely well. At the end of the day, one of my other aspirations is when someone on the Hill has a question, if it's te a technical question, if it relates to microelectronics or hypersonics or energetic materials or optimal, optimal materials or any of the other specialties, I want to call the best. I want to be, I want to be on speed dial to provide that information. So that's one of our other aspirational goals in the organization. Well, now that you opened up my Okay. <laughs> I think I know scale is run out of grain. Yes. For microelectronics. Yeah. We would love to have another scale type program for hypersonics. Yes. Would you be willing to support that through Perry and with all our corporate partners that are in hypersonics that work out of grain? Yeah, of course um, we would. I think that would be another huge push yeah. for the durable workforce that we need for the future to work on the projects that you're talking about that are specific to Perry since you need clearable workers. Yeah, so the question is would we would we be interested in supporting a workforce uh, portfolio for hypersonics? As you probably picked up, I, you know, I, I kind of like hypersonics uh, for many reasons, not the least of which is it is the neatest part of aerospace engineering. I'm sorry, it's flying higher, flying faster. Uh, I, I, I have a lot of friends in, across the aerospace disciplines, including doing UAVs and motor crafts. That's nice. But in hypersonics, we fly higher and faster. That's what every aerospace engineer ultimately aspires to do. Um, but also, very seriously, uh, I firmly believe hypersonics is a critical technology investment. One of the reasons I went back to the Pentagon was to work on hypersonics because we're in a race with your competitors and it's a race we're losing right now. And it's setting the foundation of who we have to invest in. And workforce is absolutely key. Um, one of the things that, that when I go through the list of things that keeps me awake at night related to hypersonics, it's the number of people in the, our peer competitor nations that are working on hypersonics. Um, the Chinese have put a lot of money into their universities. Uh, they are building their workforce. Uh, we we're putting money into our universities now. Uh, r and &E created a university consortium. Right now it's got over 100 universities involved. So we're trying to do the same thing in the United States. But it's, it's slow going. And getting that workforce up and running. And especially finding the clearable individuals <coughs> is no easy. So yeah, I absolutely would be, would be thrilled with the Brain is a place to make that happen. I agree. I agree. Yes. Yeah, as I said, when we were looking for an organization that could help, when I was in the Pentagon, the organization that could help us with uh, hypersonics in the first place we turned to was, was right. And setting up that field office was a critical part of the joint hypersonic transition. Yes. Other questions? Yeah. Where do you see the, the uh, uh, capability gaps in the uh, testing and evaluation? 
Oh, gosh. So, our facilities are still paid. It's quantity. Uh, the reality is that, that uh, the good news is the DOD is investing very heavily now in microsonics. I think someone at the last panel mentioned over 50 programs of microsonics in the DOD. Actually, that's wrong. That's 70 according to the General County Office, uh, including several major programs. Every one of the services has a major program. The result, though, is those programs are falling all over each other. They're climbing over each other to get time in. Right now, the backlog for wind tunnel testing in the nation is anywhere between six months and two years. So that means if you've got a program and you want to do a test, uh, deadlines could be two years before you get to do that test. I mean, it has other, other bad implications, by the way. Let's suppose you do your test, and something goes wrong, an instrument fails, the model breaks off the steam, a wire breaks, you want an extra day to test, <laughs> sorry, you're out of luck. Get, get to the back of the queue. Um, or let's say you do a test and you see something interesting. You, know, you see boundary layer transition where you didn't expect it. You need to do a couple more tests to explore what was going on. Again, you're out of luck. Um, same is true with uh, flight tests. So we have made it very difficult for ourselves to flight test. And you heard some mention in the last panel also about not being risk averse. We've become so risk averse. We are flight testing at about one tenth the rate at which the Chinese are flight testing. Um, what is that? What are the consequences of that? Well, it, it slows down our development. It also means that our success rate in flight tests is embarrassingly low. Now, I will step back and I will argue that you want to fail sometimes. If you're not failing in flight tests, you didn't need to do the flight test. But there are noble failures, and then there are stupid failures. Noble failures, you didn't know how something was going to work. You didn't know how hot the leading edge was going to get. You didn't know if your material was going to survive. That's a noble failure. A dumb failure is fin falls off the rocket. Wire got crimped when the rocket was being put together, and so it didn't, it didn't go off. Those are dumb failures. A lot of our failures fall into the dumb failure category. And then you step back and say, why is that happening? Because we're not doing it enough. The Chinese have a better than 80, last I checked, a better than 85% success rate in flight tests. Ours is less than 50%. And that's what we're being charged So we need to get in the air more often, and we need to be ground testing. And those two go together. Um, one of the misnomers in hypersonics is it's either or. Oh, if I'm going to ground test, I don't need to flight test. Or if I'm going to flight test, I don't need to ground test. That's absolutely wrong. They go together. And then you couple that to modeling and simulation. And, and to that end, though, we obviously don't have flight test capabilities at Parry. Um, we're looking to partner with organizations that do flight tests, including some corporate partners. Um, one I'll highlight is the company called Stratolaunch, which is operating a flight test platform out of Mojave. And they've actually located an office in Discovery Park so they can work with us. And their lead for, flight, for, for future flight tests at Stratolaunch is in the heart facility basically every day, looking at how he can link from the ground into flight. So pretty exciting, pretty exciting event. So for a traditional venture fund, uh, the aspirations to have a key performance indicator is return on investment. Yes. So for Dow Ventures, can you tell me three aspirational outcomes and three APIs? <laughs> <laughs> so um, basically that was the same. Has, has those traditional metrics. All right. In fact, all of Carry has that. So, so I mentioned that big investment that that Purdue was made. And on my very first day in the job, um, the campus treasurer pulled me aside and said, "Now you know we expect Carry to be sustainable in five years." So across the board, we're looking at sustainability for Carry. Campus made investment, but eventually we're supposed to be bringing a return on that investment. Um, I will argue that part of that investment is also intellectual capital, but um, at Purdue, I mean, it's very clear that part of that investment is also the use of dollars that we bring in to keep those facilities going. Um, but yeah, bottom line, return on, return on the investment. So, are you aware of any university venture fund that has been sustainable based on our own money? I'm hoping to prove that we can do it. <laughs> that's, how's that for a diplomatic answer? Yeah, no, it looked, I know it's a challenge. Um, and, um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of experience looking at universities that have placed big bets in certain key areas, and those bets very seldom pan out. But the value of interest part is relatively small, it's relatively much larger. So 
it's a few million dollars in the portfolio. We also have casino gambling in Indiana. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, at that other university that I was affiliated with, so I'll pay another quick little anecdote, which is, yeah, I, I, I spent a couple years as the Air Force Chief Scientist, so when I did that, I was on loan from the campus. I come back to the campus, lots of hilarious stories about what that was like. But about a month or so into my, my return, um, our department had a visit from the brand new campus intellectual property office. And they were basically yelling at our department, it's the aerospace department at the university. They were yelling at us because we didn't produce enough patents. And the university wanted patents because they thought patents was where they were going to make money. Side note, some universities have made money on patents, but not a lot. Um, but at any rate, so I started going through the numbers and you know, I had, they, they wanted our department, so we were department about 20 time, about 25 faculty members, so they wanted us to be producing roughly 25 patents a year. And so I said, excuse me, how many patents are we producing right now? The department's producing like one or two a year. And then I said, how many patents do we produce across the entire campus? And the answer was, oh, the entire campus has about 20 a year. I said, wait a minute, so you want our one department to do more patents than the entire university within a year. And that was the goal. Okay. And then I asked, I started going through their numbers in real time, which is always a fun exercise. And I ultimately got to the quick point that the university was spending more money to run that patent office than they could ever hope to recover unless they really did win a lottery ticket. Right? So I am, bottom line, I am really familiar with universities trying to make investments and having eyesight. Um, for me, that was more of an exciting thing than anything else. It's kind of the rush you do get out of casino gambling, knowing that you're not going to win because the odds are always back against you. But they're, they're actually investing in some really interesting companies, to do some fun stuff. So, um, there, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned uh, TTRI. Yes. Yeah. Oh my god, yes, yes. Yeah, they, they have been. So, um, so the, when back when I was in the Pentagon, uh, actually all those organizations, the UR stands for scenes, were actually run by my office. So I I, I, I did know the leads for, for those various organizations. But more importantly, they don't really see us as competing with them. They've been really clear. You look at most of those organizations. You know, they have their specialties. If, if you look at our portfolio, it doesn't really overlap with what any of them do. Um, especially the URs usually have a special sponsor. And, uh, and, uh, and, and an area of regard. Um, the first thing I heard from the GTRI folks, and they were very eager to talk about their experiences and what has worked and, and what hasn't worked, by the way. And um, among those, they pointed out that they actually have much more, many more requests for work than they can satisfy. So they didn't actually see us as a threat. My, my response, by the way, was, well, if you get, when you get those requests, send them our way, we'll take them. But um, same thing with Lincoln Lab, same thing uh, with we talk folks in national labs. Uh, we, we've, got, we've gotten a tremendous measure of support. Um, I'll also tell you, I'm going to come back to the Indiana ecosystem. And of course, Harry is a new enterprise, but we're already looking at teaming activities with Indiana University and Notre Dame. There's a plan to build a research ecosystem that, 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 that supports training with uh, those three universities. And, um, those other universities have seen us carry as a strength for the whole state, not as not as a effort. So again, we've got to be careful with that. One last question. One last question. One last question. So for small businesses, we're used to working with severe Yeah. Maybe take plus years to actually get innovation through the system. Yeah. How do you envision carrying? Working with um, small industry, specialties. What, what, what kind of pathways? Uh, so, so the question is, what kind of pathways can we uh, utilize for working with with small businesses? And the answer is, we basically <laughs> spare any pathway that you, you would imagine for interacting between uh, not for profit and industrial partner. Um, we can do STTRs because we're part of the university infrastructure. Uh, we can always run. Contracting activities through the main campus, by the way, delivering facilities at, at the area. Um, but one of the very unique aspects, you, know, you talk about the time it takes to get a, uh, an SPIR or an STTR out of the laboratory in the hands 
kinds of end user. Um, we can work on different time scales. So you know, having spent most of my life as a university professor, I know universities tend to think in terms of units of useful graduate student activity. So, you know, it takes four years to produce a PhD student, so projects run for four years. It takes a year and a half to two years for a master's student, so projects run. We, we, we've got dedicated research staff that aren't tied to an academic calendar. We've also got pregnancy to work in the organization. But so we can, in, in principle, move quickly. Um, we're also key to what we're doing. When people sign on or parry, they know that they're not going to be expected to publish. On the rest of the university campus, as you know, it's publish or perish. At Parry, by the very nature of what we're doing, it's not publish or perish. And that was also one of the, the upfront agreements that I got up when I signed this job. We're going to be successful. We need to build a workforce that is not held to the same standards as the rest of the campus. So we can do things that are classified, that are sensitive, that are proprietary, and honor you know, IP rights, for example, in ways that the main campus. Yeah, I think I'm out of time. So, hey, thank you, thank you so much for your attention. Thanks for thanks for sticking with us, and I'll look forward to chatting with you um, after. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. I think his personally, I think his passion and uh, enthusiasm for this is just contagious. So, even though I don't understand it technically, <laughs> he makes me understand the content the way I, the way I think I should understand. So, so I appreciate that. And plus, I think he's funny. I think he's just a funny man. I think you're really funny. So. <laughs> no, 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 no. Very knowledgeable. So, so thank you for taking the time. I know he's a very busy man. Uh, we will have offices here for Perry. So at some point in time, we'll even have employees from Perry here. So, so that will be a resource that we'll have. So. Again, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate this. Uh, I know I, I, I really appreciate you coming because I know it was, a, it was a task for him to be here. So um, just as I mentioned about the other First Tuesday events, we just continue to get some great A-lists for people in here. Um, as I mentioned, enhanced, reliable, trusted, dynamic slide ups, and, and many more. But also, uh, next month, we will actually have the love list from IU. I know he mentioned about a partnership with IU. IU is actually investing a lot in the tech part in NSMC Crane for microelectronics as well. So Daniel Loveless, who is a professor at IU, was an integral part of that. So he will be speaking on that connection next month. And also, he mentioned the thrust area of energetic materials. And he mentioned Stephen Bodine. I think that's how you pronounce it, Bodine. Um, he has agreed to do a first Tuesday as well. So next month, December, will be Daniel Loveless. We will not have one in January because the 1st of January, everybody's on holiday. Uh, so I think it's February 6th, I believe. I can't remember what the date is, but actually the same day as Connected Mission, I'm sure. But anyway, it'll be Stephen Bodine will be here speaking on energetic materials too. So uh, again, we want to thank NSTXL for sponsoring this event. Go to westgateacademy.com to see any of our future events. Let me know if you have questions on co-working space here. If you have questions on the tech park, I've been here for a long time, so I can put good connection with, with other people if necessary. Let's go out and have some drinks and refreshments from Switchyard Brewery. Thank you again.